to 2,021 kilometers per hour, um, and any other data that you have offered to us here today. As most of you will probably know, uh, United States are currently in the process of designing and build a high-speed railway line from Los Angeles to San Francisco. Uh, cities of Sacramento and uh, San Diego will also be connected with this uh, railway line. And to share with all of us uh, their vision and experience, uh, today are here with, with us Mr. Ventry Posis, Northern Regional Director of the California High Speed Railway. Hello, Ben. Welcome. And also, Mr. Martin Watts, Distinguished Professor Emeritus of Urban Planning, University of California, Los Angeles, and member. Thanks for coming. It's a great pleasure for us to have you all here with all of us, and entirely up to you. Thank you. Um, it's a great honor to have been invited. I thank the organizing committee for the invitation, and it's a pleasure to come from UCLA to UCLM. Uh, I, I find that very amusing. High-speed rail in California is very important, but the future of it remains fragile. It's still uncertain. California is similar to Spain in some respects. Population of California is 40 million, of Spain is 47 million. The area is similar. The distance between Barcelona and Madrid is similar to the distance between Los Angeles and San Diego. But there are also geographic differences that are very, very important. Uh, the, the pattern of a high-speed rail program being planned in California is much more linear, and in Spain is more star-shaped, or like an asterisk. Um, and the cities, the large cities in California, are much more aligned along a single route. Uh, the plan is to begin with what is shown in blue, um, and it's called phase one, um, and that will come first, and it's from San Francisco to Anaheim, which is just a little bit beyond Los Angeles, and then the parts in yellow will follow in later years, connecting the system to Sacramento in the north and San Diego in the south. Um, the, the system is under construction. Uh, it's already, was it 119 miles? of it is already being built, um, and uh, the first train is proposed to be in 2026, and I'm guessing it's more likely something like 2029, uh, it's all, but it is already under construction, and that's very, very important. And the reasons for building high-speed rail in California are that the population is growing to fifth, toward 50 million. The roads and the airspace in, within the state are already congested. Um, the idea of doing this, though, is much, much grander than just addressing existing congestion. The, the notion is to integrate the economy of the state by bringing Los Angeles and San Francisco closer to one another, by bringing San Diego and Sacramento closer to one another, lowering the cost of doing business between them, and creating a, a growth in the economy because of that integration. Um, and in addition, we hope, planners hope, that we can concentrate future development at higher density nodes, reducing sprawl, which has been the long-standing pattern of growth in California. And we have very valuable agricultural land in the middle of the state, the Central Valley, we call it. And by concentrating development near the station sites, we very much want to preserve the land that's devoted to very productive agricultural land uh, in the center of the state. And not a small factor is that the system is intended to create jobs in construction and operation of the system. And among the strongest advocates for building this system are uh, organized labor organizations in the state of California. But there remains quite a lot of opposition to high-speed rail in California. 
Uh, in general, many people oppose it on the grounds of its cost. It's going to cost 60, 70, 80 billion dollars, um, and that's a lot of money which otherwise could be used for schools and other uh, social purposes. Um, and so the cost is the main objection raised by many people. Um, but there's also an argument that the state has a physically dispersed development pattern and that air and auto systems serve that dispersion much better than would a, uh, a concentrated rail in a single corridor. Um, the, uh, the fact that automated vehicles, cars and trucks are predicted to be coming within the same time frame as high-speed rail also adds some uncertainty to whether or not alternative technologies might address the needs of the state as well. And there are some who say the environmental benefits are exaggerated because the ground or surface transportation to get to or from the stations will continue to be more traditional uh, technology. But in addition to those general statewide objective, uh, objections or concerns about high-speed rail, there are more specific ones in local areas that, that in some ways are more dramatic because they're associated with lawsuits. Uh, communities along the route are fighting the disruption and the, uh, the impacts caused by construction and the noise and the closure of roads making it possible to run high-speed trains. Landowners are seeking higher compensation for their land. Low-income communities say they're being impacted too heavily in relation to middle and upper income communities. And by the way, these are standard um, uh, objections to major infrastructure projects throughout California. It's not unique or special to high-speed rail, but it very much affects high-speed rail. Um, the, the, I won't go, because of the lateness of the hour, I won't go through this in detail, but uh, the high-speed rail program in California has uh, evolved over a very long time already, starting in 1981, when Governor Pat Brown, the father of the current Governor Jerry Brown, um, discussed high-speed rail as very promising with Japan National Railways, and uh, by uh, 2008, we had a, the voters approved about a $10 billion bond issue with a 53% majority of the votes, not a large majority, but enough to, to approve it. And then in 2009, the state uh, achieved some uh, federal grants which have been valuable in getting us to the point that we are. But the, um, the way the planning goes is that every two years, the High Speed Rail Authority issues a business plan update. And the next one is due next year, 2018. And it's a very, very important one because it's, uh, construction is already underway and because there is an election for a new governor in the year 2018. And some of the candidates will be very pro-rail and some will be against it. So the 2018 is a very pivotal year. We're making progress on the ground, but, it, but there are still some very important questions. The business plan, which will appear in 2018, as it did in 2016 and 2014, addresses the types of services that are being planned, description of the benefits, the milestones, what will be built in what year, forecasts of ridership, uh, operation and maintenance costs, capital costs, and uh, an estimate of the, where the funds will come from. And that's very, very important, especially when it happens in the same year as the election of a new governor. So the, 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 uh, the political environment in California within which this is taking place is enormously important. And it's often misunderstood by people who address high-speed rail in California but who aren't experiencing those politics on an everyday basis. They're very, very dramatic. Uh, we have very strong environmental laws. Something called the California Environmental Quality Act protects species, uh, sets goals for cleaning the air, reducing greenhouse gases, and gives any citizen the right to sue uh, if they believe that the act is being violated. So it's very strong environmental law. And in California, we also have what we refer to as direct democracy to raise funds. The voters have to approve of that. And for, to raise new sources of taxation, 
the voters have to approve of it with a two-thirds majority. So these are major barriers and, very, and, and therefore many of the characteristics of the rail system which people from outside California say, well, you know, that's not ideal. No, it may not be ideal, but it's necessary to address the complex politics in the region and the different interests that are promoting different objectives. Um, there's been a great deal of litigation, and so far, the vast majority of the court decisions have supported the rail program going forward, and many of those objecting, while, it slowed, while their cases slowed the process down, in the end, they did not prevail. Uh, the state remains very divided on high-speed rail, and the fights are continuing. So uh, think of this not as a project that is uh, has a clear future because the future will constantly be affected by the necessity to respond to the, to the politics of the moment. A recent poll showed that 63% of the population in the state support the concept of high-speed rail, but many fewer support any particular tax or particular fee or particular expenditure on high-speed rail. Um, so some just to review some of the key program elements and the requirements in law, the law says that the trains must move from San Francisco to LA, uh, Los Angeles, uh, under two hours and 40 minutes. That's written into law. That constrains the way the planners can work because they must comply with that uh, requirement, and if they don't, they'll be sued. Um, there, there's also a requirement that there be no operating subsidy. When it is operating, not the capital cost, there is a capital cost subsidy, of course, the, the, the public money will pay to build it, but when it is built, the operations must be self-sustaining. And that's in California law. That's very, very important. And the plan has all along been that capital financing, the front end, the building of it, would be financed in thirds, with the state providing a third, the federal government providing a third, and hopefully private investors providing a third. So far, the burden has fallen on the state, and the federal government and private sector have contributed much less than these proportions. Um, so the strategy of the High Speed Rail Authority is to, uh, I think it's clear, to advance construction as quickly as possible to build as much as is possible um, because the more you have on the ground, the harder it's going to be for op opponents to stop the project. And that also dictates what is built and, and what is built first um, so that more can be built to demonstrate that the project is underway. Uh, there was a federal grant that, that I mentioned earlier. It expired in September of 2017 and any money that had not been spent by then would have had to have been returned to the federal government. Not surprisingly, the High Speed Rail Authority managed to spend all the federal money by the, by the deadline, and it did so in part well, very wisely by stockpiling material and so forth that will be used in future uh, segments of the facility. Um, the, the, uh, the goal, of course, includes initiating high speed rail service as soon as possible because the belief is, and I think it's correct, that the private sector will become more interested in participating financially once there are trains running on the ground. They see too much risk in the short term when you know, the, the future is still a, a decade away uh, to see the trains running. Um, oh, and not, uh, just uh, the last line, very importantly, the High Speed Rail Authority part of its strategy is to work with local governments, with Los Angeles and, and San Francisco and San Jose and other cities along the right-of-way to make sure that the local planning of land use and activities around the stations is supportive of the high-speed rail concept that is coming in a little while. So these two slides illustrate two projects in uh, where there is existing train service um, where improvements are upgrading the existing service, making it better, but also readying those areas for high-speed rail. So um, on the left, you see a grade crossing. It's the busiest and most dangerous railroad crossing in the state of California. Um, it's in Southern California. Um, uh, and there is high-speed rail money plus other funds, about eight or nine different programs were merged 
to come up with the billions of dollars needed to replace this busy rail crossing with an underpass for the, for the rail uh, operations that work there now, but of course that will accommodate the future high-speed rail. Uh, the other example on the right side is the uh, uh, Caltrain service, the passenger service that's been in existence for decades in Northern California, but it was operated only by diesel-powered uh, uh, trains, and since high-speed rail will operate on that right-of-way, there's an improvement program underway that will electrify that, and it's already just beginning construction uh, with some federal money and, and a good deal of local money. Again, partnership and funding it to make it possible. Um, but the important point here is that even if the high-speed rail isn't delivered in the time frame uh, proposed, the benefits of the grade crossing removal and the benefits of electrification of the existing service environmental benefits and efficiency benefits will be realized for the citizens of California, and demonstrating those benefits helps to make the case for, for high-speed rail in the long term. And we're very um, moving ahead very aggressively with local area planning. The slide on the right is Los Angeles Union Station. It's, uh, it opened just before the Great Depression. Uh, in the, it was one of the last large train stations to open in the United States uh, just before the 1929 stock market crash. And it's, uh, it's going to accommodate high-speed rail with major, major improvements that are gonna cost by themselves billions of dollars. The slide on the left shows uh, the San Jose station area, another large city along the right-of-way. And advanced planning is already underway that includes new land uses and new operation uh, changes in the way the trains move through those areas. So, coming to the near, uh, near to the end of my presentation, I want to summarize before uh, Ben uh, takes over and talks from the perspective of, of the agency which is building this. Uh, there are six major challenges uh, facing California high-speed rail. The, the first and most obvious is an enormous funding gap. This project will cost 60 to $70 billion, and so far we have identified, we've, we have in the bank, so to speak, 12 to 15 billion, and yet by moving ahead, we believe that there will be higher probability of raising additional funds, but those funds have to be raised. The principal way we're doing that, the, the principal source of funding in California is the cap and trade program. I'm hopeful that most of you know what cap and trade refers to uh, greenhouse gas emissions are allowed by, uh, by polluters and they pay to uh, 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 have their emissions allowed and each year they're allowed fewer emissions and hopefully the cost of the permits to emit pollution will produce revenue because um, uh, over the years we hope to get to zero greenhouse gas emissions but in the next decade or two uh, they will continue to emit and they will pay, and they are already paying. But it's a very um, uh, highly uncertain market. Some of the auctions of permits have produced far less revenue. Some have produced more revenue, uh, and, and it's hard to predict. Um, so in, in order to do this, the, we have shifted the initial operating segment to a less expensive segment to get more built. Uh, but that means, of course, that more money is going to be needed later to address some of the more expensive um, elements of, of, the, of the program. Um, so the funding gap, as I mentioned it, uh, right now in the last business plan, $64 billion was, was seen to be the full um, um, capital cost. A, a new tunnel has been added through the Pacheco Pass through the mountains in the north and crossing very steep and, and difficult terrain between Bakersfield and Los Angeles in the south uh, remains to be funded in the, in the future, and those are very costly elements of the project. Um, 14 members of the Republican Party who represent California in Congress have unanimously said that they will oppose any further federal funding while the, they are a minority of all of the Congress members from California because a majority are Democrats rather than Republicans, that's a formidable challenge to the, to the funding of the system. 
The last federal uh, transportation bill called the FAST Act uh, provided intercity rail with $10 billion of funding for the whole country for the next five years. And, and as you saw, the California project itself is 64 or more uh, billion dollars. So there's a shortfall of federal funds. A federal grant program, transportation infrastructure grants for economic recovery, or TIGER, uh, has had uh, eight rounds of funding and has uh, awarded 137 projects in 50 states out of 1,800 applications. And if, if we seek funding from that program, it's highly competitive. And it's not certain that California would win in that competition. And then there's a federal loan program which lends up to $300 million a year for, uh, for the next five years, but that must be repaid by state funds. So the funding remains the greatest challenge. The private sector has shown itself to be interested. There were 33 expressions of interest from the private sector, but I've read all 33 of them, and they all say, but we want to be protected from risk with public guarantees that, uh, that there'll be a public backup of funding if the private sector uh, experiences losses due to lower demand than is forecast. They're willing to accept construction risk the, the, the cost escalation that comes from construction, they're not willing to ex uh, accept market risk, and that falls back on the state. Crossing the Tehachapi's, this is a big, expensive part of the system. The pictures show an existing freight line, and you see how challenging the terrain is. That's one train crossing under itself. Um, and obviously, high-speed rail is going to require a much more gentle slope, and th this uh, one track was built uh, well over 120 years ago, and it, th this part of the system is a, is a very big gap, and yet it would be the single most useful addition to the California rail system because there's no passenger service through that part of the mountains. Um, so project cost costs are likely to grow um, because we make compromises to avoid litigation by agreeing to demands of many different interest groups. Um, this, there is an, a, a process underway to have the advice of those who currently operate rail systems around the world. Uh, bids were received, I think, just three weeks ago to join in the, that effort, and that included uh, consortia from China, Spain, Italy, and Germany. A selection will be made soon. That will result in more detailed planning of transit operations. So, so to close, 2018 will be an important year. There are many accomplishments already underway. There are risks, though. Costs are likely to rise. The 2018 business plan could cause a political uproar among opponents because costs are likely to rise. The federal commitment to infrastructure articulated by the Trump administration is not materializing. And public opinion is fragile and changing from time to time. So thank you very much for your interest, and I think Ben will speak next about further details.